Hello and welcome to our first lecture of this ultrasound physics course. Um, I hope you enjoy all of this and you learn and this helps to understand the ultrasound a little bit better and if you're getting ready for the SPI exam this becomes the perfect tool for you to pass this examination. Um, so number one I have this question for you. Think about this. What is ultrasound? What is ultrasound? And, uh, you know, what gives you the answer is the word ultra, ultrasound, ultra, all right? And uh, before going in there, let me tell you, there, there's something that we call the audible range. There's a range of frequencies that the human being is able to listen and how this works. We're talking about this range of frequencies that goes from 20 hertz to... 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz, which is the same. Kilo means a thousand. Um, going in there, let me tell you that all the frequencies that we have between this range, they are audible, so we are able to listen to those. But the frequencies that are under 20 hertz, we are not able to hear anything. And we call those infra sound. All right, we call this one infrasound. And ultrasound is all those frequencies that are above 20,000 hertz. So we call this ultrasound, all right? Does it make sense? So point number one for the ultrasound concept. We are talking about sound waves which frequencies are above 20 kilohertz. So let's repeat this one more time. Let's repeat this one more time. Ultrasound is a sound wave which frequencies are above 20 kilohertz. All right, so we have point number one right here. Okay, so I want you to take notes during this course. All right, and this is important. All right, so we're talking about the ultrasound concept. All right, and number one, remember. Ultrasound uses frequencies above 20 kilohertz, all right? Now, let me tell you something. Those frequencies are not enough to produce images. So, we have something that we call the imaging range. And we are talking about higher frequencies in here. For example, the imaging range can go from 2 to 20 megahertz and this is not something that is fixed we have probes in the market we have transducers in the market that they can go above 20 megahertz all right they can go above 20 megahertz but as a general rule so we're talking about from 2 million hertz mega means million all right from 2 million hertz to 20 million hertz and that's what you know most of the systems in the market use in order to produce pictures now the question is why don't why you know using different frequencies and not a fixed one why do we use different frequencies and not a fixed one and the reason is because there is a principle that says the following if we have high frequency congratulations let me tell you something you have a better resolution perfect and beautiful resolution all right but then we have a problem in here we have a trade-off and the trade-off is that we have less penetration that's why we have those high frequency probes like for example the linear sequential and we're going to talk about those probes in the future so the linear sequential is a high frequency probe that we use for um, you know doing peripheral vascular like for example if we're going to check the carotid arteries uh, we use this for MSK sonography if we want to take a look to tendons we're going to take a look to ligaments and joints 
and all of those around. So we're talking about emissions that we're, you know, approaching from the superficial aspect, all right? Because we have high frequency, perfect resolution, but then we start losing in penetration. Now, if we want to go deeper, then we may select a low frequency transducer because, you know, we're going to have more penetration. Like, for example, the convex, you know, we have used the convex for the abdomen. We want to take a look to the aorta or to the renal arteries. We're going to take a look to the pancreas, for example. So we use a low frequency transducer looking for more penetration. But then we have the problem here. The problem is that the resolution is going to decrease. Resolution is going to decrease. So as you see it, ultrasound is something like, sometimes I compare this to life. You gain in one part, sometimes you lose in the other. This everything is a balance. And that's what makes ultrasound beautiful, all right? Because we're going to go over so many concepts that they work this way. All right, so don't forget about this. We have an imaging range that in most of the systems can go from 2 megahertz to 20 megahertz. And this is based on the principle that if you have more frequency, hey, you have better resolution, but you have less penetration. But if you have less frequency, you're going to have more penetration, but then you have less resolution. All right, so don't forget about point number one. This is point number two. Point number one is ultrasound uses frequencies above 20 kilohertz. How is it going on till now? I hope you're enjoying all of this, okay? But this is not all. We have more points in the ultrasound, more things that we have to go over. And uh, we're going to take a look to our point number three in here. And uh, let me tell you something. The ultrasound is made of particles, right? And those particles, sometimes they are together and sometimes they are apart. And sometimes they go back again and they, you know, they go together one more time and they go apart, all right? And they alternate this way, sometimes together, then apart, then together, then apart, then together, then apart. This is what we call the rhythm, the rhythm. There is an oscillation in here that, you know, makes the sound alternate into this high pressure zones and this low pressure zones. It's high, low, high, low, high, low. It's not supposed to be, it's not supposed to be high, high, low, high, low, low, no. This is very organized. This is very organized. So um, these particles are going to move energy from point A to point B. These particles are going to move energy from point A to point B. And these areas where the particles are going to be, you know, together, we call this compressions. All right, and the areas or the zones where the particles are going to be apart, we call this rarefactions. Rarefactions, okay? Now, only one particle, only one particle in here is going to make this. It has a neutral point, has a positive point, and has a negative point, and it's going to move back and forth this way it's going to move back and forth so one particle is going to make something like this they're going to positive neutral negative positive neutral negative positive neutral negative so how this point is going to be and please take your notebook and take this note point number three it says the following ultrasound is made of particles that move energy from point A to point B. One particle is, is able to move back and forth. When the particles are organized in a high pressure, high density zone, all right, don't forget about this, high pressure, high density zone, we call this compressions. When the particles are organized in low pressure, low density zones, we call this rarefaction. So 
In other words, the sound is made of is made of compressions and rarefactions. Particles that go together in high pressure, high density zones, particles that go apart in low pressure, low density zones. How is it going so far? I hope you're understanding all of this. We have three points until now. Then let me tell you something. We're going to go to point number four right now. We're going to go to point number four. And it says the following. In nature, we have longitudinal and transverse waves. Longitudinal and transverse waves. The difference is like in a longitudinal wave, the particles, they move parallel to the main axis of the wave. So if the wave moves this way, the particles, they go this way, right? In a transverse wave, you know, the wave is going to move this way and the particles are going to move up and down, up and down, up and down, forming a 90 degree angle, so perpendicular to the main axis of the wave. So don't forget about this. We have longitudinal and transverse waves. So the ultrasound, the ultrasound is a longitudinal wave. The ultrasound is a longitudinal wave because the particles move in the same direction and parallel to the main axis of the sound of the wave. So let me repeat this one more time and please take note. The sound is a longitudinal wave and the ultrasound too. The only difference between the sound and the ultrasound is the range of frequencies, all right? So the sound or the ultrasound is a longitudinal wave because those particles are going to move parallel to the main axis of the wave, all right? So it's a longitudinal wave. And number five. What do we have for number five? Um, in nature, we have mechanical waves and we have electromagnetic waves, all right? Mechanical versus electromagnetic. The difference, you know, they have to have many differences in here. But we're going to focus on the ability of this wave to go through the vacuum. So we call the vacuum to something that is, that is empty, that there is empty, that there's no any particle in there, you know, vacuum, empty. Think about that. So the electromagnetic waves, they can go through this vacuum. They can go through, right? But the sound needs a medium to go through. It could be air, it could be bone, it could be uh, muscle, it could be water, but the sound needs a medium to go through, all right? So therefore, the sound cannot travel through the vacuum. Let me repeat this one more time. The sound cannot travel through the vacuum, all right? So that's why the sound is a mechanical wave. So let me repeat this one more time. Let me repeat this one more time. And for today, we're just going to go over this lecture, this intro lecture in here. All right. It's going to be short so you understand the concept. And then later, we're going to start putting more information into this course because it's going to it's going to become more complex over time. But if you understand this, we are fine and I'm going to feel happy that you are, you know, getting all of this information. So, number one, ultrasound. Ultrasound uses frequencies above 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz. It's not in the audible range, so we cannot hear it. The imaging range, most of the systems, it can change from system to system, from 2 megahertz to 20 megahertz. So, we need more frequency in order to produce pictures. But don't forget about this rule that says the following, all right? More frequency, better resolution, congratulations, but less penetration. Less frequency, well, resolution is going to be degraded, but then you're going to have more penetration. This is a very important principle for you to understand what probe are you going to use when you're scanning. It makes sense. Okay, so number three, we have this. The sound is made of compressions and rarefactions. Compressions are high pressure, high density zones, 
rarefactions or low pressure, low density zones. All right. One particle can go back and forth, but the sound is able to move energy from point A to point B. Number four, the sound is a longitudinal wave because the particles move parallel to the main axis of the wave. Number five, the sound is a mechanical wave. because it needs a medium to go through. And this is the concept. Before leaving you today, um, and then you can advance to the next lecture, let me explain some little things in here that we're going to use, some words, some terminology that we're going to use all the time. So we're going to use the word directly related all the time, or this expression, directly related. And when that's the case, let me tell you, for example, you have A equals B over C, or divided by C. We say that A is directly related to B. So meaning that if B increases, then A is going to increase as well. All right. So we're going to use this term all the time, directly related all the time. And we're going to use this sign in here. It's like a little fish. All right. So we're going to use this as directly related. Now, we're going to use this other term that we call inversely related. And that's the case of A and C. If C increases, A is going to decrease. If C increases, A is going to decrease. And we're going to use this sign in here. That means inversely related. So. We're going to use these terms all the time. So you get familiar with this and your life is going to be a lot easier to understand the physics, which is beautiful. All right. Which is beautiful. So thank you for making it today for our first lecture. And please take notes all the time. That's my advisements in here. So um, uh, please, uh, if you have your notebook, take a section of your notebook in here. So I advise you to, you know, take a segment of your notebook to you know for formulas we're going to see a lot of formulas in here a lot of equations all right use a section of your notebook for that all right and use a section of your notebook for notes and to compare one term to another so the key for understanding any complex material is organization and repetition so thank you one more time for making it today and i'll see you soon thank you